Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, Chapter Twenty Six. One twenty-four was quiet. Denver, who thought she knew all about silence, was surprised to learn hunger could do that, quiet you down and wear you out. Neither Sethi or Beloved knew or cared about it one way or another. They were too busy rationing their strength to fight each other. So it was she who had to step off the edge of the world and die because if she didn't, they all would. The flesh between her mother's forefinger and thumb was thin as china silk, and there wasn't a piece of clothing in the house that didn't sag on her. Beloved held her head up with the palms of her hands, slept wherever she happened to be, and whined for sweets although she was getting bigger, plumper by the day. Everything was gone except two laying hands, and somebody would soon have to decide whether an egg every now and then was worth more than two fried chickens. The hungrier they got, the weaker. The weaker they got, the quieter they were. Which was better than the furious arguments? The poker slammed up against the wall. All the shouting and crying that followed that one happy January when they played. Denver had joined in the play. Holding back a bit out of habit, even though it was the most fun she had ever known. But once Sethi had seen the scar, the tip of which Denver had been looking at whenever Beloved undressed, the little curved shadow of a smile in the coochie coochie coo place under her chin. Once Sethi saw it, fingered it, and closed her eyes for the long time, the two of them cut Denver out of the games. The cooking games, the sewing games, the hair and dressing up games, games her mother loved so well she took to going to work later and later each day until the predictable happened. Sawyer told her not to come back, and instead of looking for another job, said they played all the harder with beloved, who never got enough of anything: lullabies, new stitches, the bottom of the cake bowl, the top of the milk. If the hen had only two eggs, she got both. It was as though her mother had lost her mind, like Grandma Baby calling for pink and not doing the things she used to. But different because, unlike Baby Suggs, she cut Denver out completely. Even the song that she used to sing to Denver, she sang for Beloved alone. Hi Johnny, wide Johnny, don't you leave my side, Johnny. At first, they played together. A whole month, and Denver loved it. From the night they ice skated under a star-loaded sky and drank sweet milk by the stove, to the string puzzles Sethi did for them in afternoon light, and shadow pictures in the gloaming. In the very teeth of winter, and Sethi, her eyes fever bright, was plotting a garden of vegetables and flowers, talking, talking about what colors it would have. She played with Beloved's hair, braiding, puffing, tying, oiling it until it made Denver nervous to watch her. They changed beds and exchanged clothes, walked arm in arm, and smiled all the time. When the weather broke, they were on their knees in the backyard designing a garden in dirt too hard to chop. The thirty-eight dollars of life savings went to feed themselves with fancy food and decorate themselves with ribbon and dress goods, which said they cut and sold like they were going somewhere in a hurry. Bright clothes with blue stripes and sassy prints. She walked the four miles to John Shillito's to buy yellow ribbon, shiny buttons, and bits of black lace. By the end of March, the three of them looked like carnival women with nothing to do. When it became clear that they were only interested in each other, Denver began to drift from the play. But she watched it, alert for any sign that Beloved was in danger. Finally, convinced there was none, and seeing her mother that happy, that smiling, how could it go wrong? She let her guard down, and it did. Her problem at first was trying to find out who was to blame. Her eye was on her mother for a signal that the thing that was in her was out, and she would kill again. But it was Beloved who made demands. Anything she wanted, she got. And when Sethi ran out of things to give her, Beloved invented desire. She wanted Sethi's company for hours to watch the layer of brown leaves waving at them from the bottom of the creek. In the same place where, as a little girl, Denver played in the silence with her, 
Now the players were altered. As soon as the thaw was complete, beloved gazed at her gazing face, rippling, folding, spreading, disappearing into the leaves below. She flattened herself on the ground, dirtying her bold stripes, and touched the rocking faces with her own. She filled basket after basket with the first things warmer weather let loose in the ground: dandelions, violets, forsythia. Presenting them to Sethi, who arranged them, stuck them, wound them all over the house. Dressed in Sethi's dresses, she stroked her skin with the palm of her hand. She imitated Sethi, talked the way she did, laughed the way she laughed, and used her body the same way down to the walk. The way Sethi moved her hands, sighed through her nose, held her head. Sometimes coming upon them, making men and women cookies, or tracking scraps of cloth on Baby Sug's old quilt, it was difficult for Denver to tell who was who. Then the mood changed, and the arguments began. Slowly at first, a complaint from the beloved, an apology from Sethi, a reduction of pleasure at some special effort the older woman made. Wasn't it too cold to stay outside? Beloved gave a look that said, "So what? Was it past bedtime? The light no good for sewing." Beloved didn't move. Said, "Do it," and Sethi complied. She took the best of everything first: the best chair, the biggest piece, the prettiest plate, the brightest ribbon for her hair. And the more she took, the more Sethi began to talk, explain, describe how much she had suffered, been through for her children. Waving away flies and grape arbors, crawling on her knees to a lean-to, none of which made the impression it was supposed to. Beloved accused her of leaving her behind, of not being nice to her, not smiling at her. She said they were the same, had the same face. How could she have left her? And Sethi cried, saying she never did or meant to, that she had to get them out away, that she had the milk all the time. And had the money too for the stone, but not enough. That her plan was always that they would all be together on the other side forever. Beloved wasn't interested. She said when she cried, there was no one. That dead men lay on top of her. That she had nothing to eat. Ghosts without skin stuck their fingers in her and said, "Beloved," in the dark and bitch in the light. Sethi pleaded for forgiveness, counting, listing again and again her reasons. That beloved was more important, meant more to her than her own life. That she would trade places any day, give up her life, every minute and hour of it, to take back just one of beloved's tears. Did she know it hurt her when mosquitoes bit her baby? That to leave her on the ground to run into the big house drove her crazy. That before leaving sweet home, beloved slept every night on her chest or curled on her back. Beloved denied it. Sethi never came to her, never said a word to her, never smiled, and worst of all, never waved goodbye or even looked her way before running away from her. When once or twice Sethi tried to assert herself, be the unquestioned mother whose word was law and who knew what was best, beloved slammed things, wiped the table clean of plates, threw salt on the floor, broke a window pane. She was not like them. She was wild game, and nobody said, "Get on out of here, girl, and come back when you get some sense." Nobody said, "You raise your hand to me, and I will knock you into the middle of next week." Axe the trunk; the limb will die. Honor thy mother and father, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I will wrap you around that doorknob. Don't nobody work for you, and God don't love ugly ways. No, no. They mended the plates, swept the salt, and little by little it dawned on Denver that if Sethi didn't wake up one morning and pick up a knife, beloved might, frightened as she was by the thing in Sethi that could come out, it shamed her to see her mother serving a girl not much older than herself. When she saw her carrying out beloved's night bucket, Denver raced to relieve her of it. When the pain was unbearable, when they ran low on food, and Denver watched her mother go without pick eating around the edges of the table and stove, the hominy that stuck on the bottom, the crusts and grinds and peelings of things, 
once she saw her run her longest finger deep in an empty jam jar before rinsing and putting it away. They grew tired, and even Beloved, who was getting bigger, seemed nevertheless as exhausted as they were. In any case, she substituted a snar or a tooth suck for waving a poker around, and 124 was quiet. Listless and sleepy with hunger, Denver saw the flesh between her mother's forefinger and thumb fade, saw Sethi's eyes bright but dead, alert but vacant, paying attention to everything about Beloved, her lineless palms, her forehead, the smile under her jaw, crooked and much too long, everything except her basket-fast stomach. She also saw the sleeves of her own carnival shirtwaist cover her fingers, Hems that once showed her ankles now swept the floor. She saw themselves berry-boned, decked out, limp and starving, but locked in a love that wore everybody out. Then Sethi spit up something she had not eaten, and it rocked Denver like gunshot. The job she started out with, protecting Beloved from Sethi, changed to protecting her mother from Beloved. Now it was obvious that her mother could die and leave them both, and what would Beloved do then? Whatever was happening, it only worked with three, not two, and since neither Beloved nor Sethi seemed to care what the next day might bring, Sethi happy when Beloved was, Beloved lapping devotion like cream, Denver knew it was on her. She would have to leave the yard, step off the edge of the world, leave the two behind and go ask somebody for help. Who would it be? Who could she stand in front of who wouldn't shame her on learning that her mother sat around like a rag doll, broke down, finally, from trying to take care of and make up for? Denver knew about several people, from hearing her mother and grandmother talk, but she knew, personally, only two. An old man with white hair called Stamp and Lady Jones. Well, Paul did, of course, and that boy who told her about Sethi. But they wouldn't do at all. Her heart kicked and an itchy burning in her throat made her swallow all her saliva away. She didn't even know which way to go. When Sethi used to work at the restaurant and when she still had money to shop, she turned right. Back when Denver went to Lady Jones' school, it was left. The weather was warm, the day beautiful. It was April and everything alive was tentative. Denver wrapped her hair and her shoulders in the brightest of the carnival dresses and wearing a stranger's shoes. She stood on the porch of 124, ready to be swallowed up in the world beyond the edge of the porch, out there where small things scratched and sometimes touched, where words could be spoken that would close your ears shut, where, if you were alone, feeling could overtake you and stick to you like a shadow. Out there, where there were places in which things so bad had happened that when you went near them, it would happen again. Like sweet home where time didn't pass and where, like her mother said, the bad was waiting for her as well. How would she know these places? What was more, much more, out there were white people and how could you tell about them? Sethi said, the mouth and sometimes the hands. Grandma Baby said there was no defense. They could prowl at will, change from one mind to another, and even when they thought they were behaving, it was a far cry from what real humans did. They got me out of jail, Sethi once told Baby Suggs. They also put you in it, she answered. They drove you across the river, on my son's back. They gave you this house. Nobody gave me nothing. I got a job from them. He got a cook from them, girl. Oh, some of them do all right by us. And every time it's a surprise, ain't it? You didn't used to talk this way. Don't box with me. There's more of us they drowned than there is all of them ever lived from the start of time. Lay down your sword. This ain't a battle, it's a rout. Remembering those conversations and her grandmother's last and final words, Denver stood on the porch in the sun and couldn't leave it. Her throat itched, her heart kicked. And then Baby Suggs laughed, clear as anything. You mean I never told you nothing about Carolina? 
about your daddy? You don't remember nothing about how come I walk the way I do, and about your mother's feet, not to speak of her back. I never told you all that. Is that why you can't walk down the steps, my Jesus, my? But you said there was no defense. There ain't. Then what do I do? Know it and go on out the yard. Go on. It came back. A dozen years had passed, and the way came back. Four houses on the right, sitting close together in a line like wrens. The first house had two steps and a rocking chair on the porch. The second had three steps, a broom propped on the porch beam, two broken chairs, and a clump of forsythia at the side. No window at the front. A little boy sat on the ground chewing a stick. The third house had yellow shutters on its two front windows and pot after pot of green leaves with white hearts or red. Denver could hear chickens and the knock of a badly hinged gate. At the fourth house, the buds of a sycamore tree had rained down on the roof and made the yard look as though grass grew there. A woman standing at the open door lifted her hand halfway in greeting, then froze it near the shoulder as she leaned forward to see whom she waved to. Denver lowered her head. Next was a tiny fenced plot with a cow in it. She remembered the plot, but not the cow. Under her headcloth, her scalp was wet with tension. Beyond her, voices, male voices, floated, coming closer with each step she took. Denver kept her eyes on the road in case they were white men, in case she was walking where they wanted to, in case they said something and she would have to answer them. Suppose they flung out at her, grabbed her, tied her. They were getting closer. Maybe she should cross the road now. Was the woman who half waved at her still there in the open door? Would she come to her rescue, or angry at Denver for not waving back? Would she withhold her help? Maybe she should turn around, get closer to the waving woman's house. Before she could make up her mind, it was too late. They were right in front of her. Two men, Negro. Denver breathed. Both men touched their caps and murmured, "Morning, morning." Denver believed her eyes spoke gratitude, but she never got her mouth open in time to reply. They moved left of her and passed on. Braced and heartened by that easy encounter, she picked up speed and began to look deliberately at the neighborhood surrounding her. She was shocked to see how small the big things were. The boulder by the edge of the road she once couldn't see over was a sitting on rock. Paths leading to houses weren't miles long. Dogs didn't even reach her knees. Letters cut into beeches and oaks by giants were eye level now. She would have known it anywhere. The post and scrap lumber fence was gray now, not white, but she would have known it anywhere. The stone porch, sitting in a skirt of ivy, pale yellow curtains at the windows, the laid brick path to the front door, and wood planks leading around to the back, passing under the windows where she had stood on tiptoe to see above the sill. Denver was about to do it again, when she realized how silly it would be to be found once more staring into the parlor of Mrs. Lady Jones. The pleasure she felt at having found the house dissolved. Suddenly in doubt, suppose she didn't live there any more, or remember her former students after all this time, what would she say? Denver shivered inside, wiped the perspiration from her forehead, and knocked. Lady Jones went to the door expecting raisins, a child probably from the softness of the lock, sent by its mother with the raisins she needed if her contribution to the supper was to be worth the trouble. There would be any number of plain cakes, potato pies. She had reluctantly volunteered her own special creation, but said she didn't have raisins, so raisins is what the president said would be provided. Early enough, so there would be no excuses. Mrs. Jones, dreading the fatigue of beating batter, had been hoping she had forgotten. Her bake oven had been cold all week. Getting it to the right temperature would be awful. Since her husband died and her eyes grew dim, she had let up to snuff housekeeping fall away. 
She was of two minds about baking something for the church. On the one hand, she wanted to remind everybody of what she was able to do in the cooking line. On the other, she didn't want to have to. When she heard the tapping at the door, she sighed and went to it, hoping the raisins had at least been cleaned. She was older, of course, and dressed like a chippy. But the girl was immediately recognizable to Lady Jones. Everybody's child was in that face: the nickel round eyes, bold yet mistrustful; the large, powerful teeth between dark, sculptured lips that did not cover them. Some vulnerability lay across the bridge of the nose, above the cheeks, and then the skin, flawless, economical, just enough of it to cover the bone and not a bit more. She must be eighteen or nineteen by now," thought Lady Jones, looking at the face young enough to be twelve. Heavy eyebrows, thick baby lashes, and the unmistakable love call that shimmered around children until they learned better. Why, Denver? She said. Look at you. Lady Jones had to take her by the hand and pull her in because the smile seemed all the girl could manage. Other people said this child was simple, but Lady Jones never believed it. Having taught her, watched her eat up a page, a rule, a figure, she knew better. When suddenly she had stopped coming, Lady Jones thought it was the nickel. She approached the ignorant grandmother one day on the road, a woods preacher who mended shoes, to tell her it was all right if the money was owed. The woman said that it wasn't it. The child was deaf and. Deaf Lady Jones thought she still was until she offered her a seat, and Denver heard that. It's nice of you to come see me. What brings you? Denver didn't answer. Well, nobody needs a reason to visit. Let me make us some tea. Lady Jones was mixed, gray eyes and yellow woolly hair, every strand of which she hated, though whether it was the color or the texture, even she didn't know. She had married the blackest man she could find, had five rainbow-colored children, and sent them all to Wilberforce. After teaching them all she knew, right along with the others who sat in her parlor, her light skin got her picked for a colored girls' normal school in Pennsylvania, and she paid it back by teaching the unpicked. The children who played in dirt until they were old enough for chores, these she taught. The colored population of Cincinnati had two graveyards and six churches, but since no school or hospital was obliged to serve them, they learned and died at home. She believed in her heart, except for her husband. The whole world, including her children, despised her and her hair. She had been listening to all that yellow gone to waste and white nigger since she was a girl in a house full of silt black children. So she disliked everybody a little bit because she believed they hated her hair as much as she did. With that education pat and firmly set, she dispensed with rancor, was indiscriminately polite, saving her real affection for the unpicked children of Cincinnati, one of whom sat before her in a dress so loud and embarrassed the needlepoint chair seat. Sugar, yes, thank you. Denver drank it all down. More. No, ma'am. Here, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. How's your family, honey? Denver stopped in the middle of a swallow. There was no way to tell her how her family was, so she said what was at the top of her mind. I want work, Miss Lady. Work, yes, ma'am. Anything. Lady Jones smiled. What can you do? I can't do anything, but I would learn it for you if you have a little extra. Extra, food, my ma'am. She doesn't feel good. Oh, baby," said Mrs. Jones. "Oh, baby." Denver looked up at her. She did not know it then, but it was the word "baby" said softly and with such kindness that inaugurated her life in the world as a woman. The trail she followed to get to that sweet thorny place was made up of paper scraps containing the handwritten names of others. Lady Jones gave her some rice, four eggs, and some tea. Denver said she couldn't be away from home long because of her mother's condition. Could she do chores in the morning? Lady Jones told her that no one, not herself, not anyone she knew, could pay anybody anything for work they did themselves. But if you all need to eat until your mother is well, all you have to do is say so. 
She mentioned her church's committee invented so nobody had to go hungry. That agitated her guest, who said no, no, as though asking for help from strangers was worse than hunger. Lady Joan said goodbye to her and asked her to come back any time, any time at all. Two days later, Denver stood on the porch and noticed something lying on the tree stump at the edge of the yard. She went to look and found a sack of white beans. Another time, a plate of cold rabbit meat. One morning, a basket of eggs sat there. As she lifted it, a slip of paper fluttered down. She picked it up and looked at it. M. Lucille Williams was written in big crooked letters. On the back was a blob of flour. Water paste. So Denver paid a second visit to the world outside the porch. Although all she said when she returned the basket was "Thank you," "Welcome," said M. Lucille Williams. Every now and then, all through the spring, names appeared near or in gifts of food, obviously for the return of the pan or plate or basket, but also to let the girl know, if she cared to, who the donor was. Because some of the parcels were wrapped in paper, and though there was nothing to return, the name was nevertheless there. Many had X's with designs about them, and Lady Jones tried to identify the plate or pen or the covering towel. When she could only guess, Denver followed her directions and went to say thank you anyway, whether she had the right benefactor or not. When she was wrong. When the person said, "No, darling, that's not my bowl. Mine's got a blue ring on it," a small conversation took place. All of them knew her grandmother, and some had even danced with her in the clearing. Others remembered the days 124 was a way station, the place they assembled to catch news, taste oxtail soup, leave their children, cut out a skirt. One remembered the tonic mixed there that cured a relative. One showed her the border of a pillow slip, the statements of its pale blue flowers, French knotted in Baby Suk's kitchen by the light of an oil lamp while arguing the settlement fee. They remembered the party with twelve turkeys and tubs of strawberry smash. One said she wrapped Denver when she was a single day old and cut shoes to fit her mother's blasted feet. Maybe they were sorry for her, or for Sethy. Maybe they were sorry for the years of their own disdain. Maybe they were simply nice people who could hold meanness toward each other for just so long, and when trouble rolled bareback among them, quickly, easily they did what they could to trip him up. In any case, the personal pride, the arrogant claim staked out at one twenty-four, seemed to them to have run its course. They whispered naturally, wondered, shook their heads. Some even laughed outright at Denver's clothes of a hussy, but it didn't stop them caring whether she ate and didn't stop the pleasure they took in her soft thank you. At least once a week, she visited Lady Jones, who perked up enough to do a raisin loaf especially for her, since Denver was set on sweet things. She gave her a book of Bible verse and listened while she mumbled words or fairly shouted them. By June, Denver had read and memorized all fifty-two pages, one for each week of the year. As Denver's outside life improved, her home life deteriorated. If the white people of Cincinnati had allowed Negroes into their lunatic asylum, they could have found candidates in one twenty-four. Strengthened by the gifts of food, the source of which neither Sethy nor Beloved questioned. The women had arrived at a doomsday truth designed by the devil. Beloved sat around, ate, went from bed to bed. Sometimes she screamed, "Ring, ring!" and clawed her throat until rubies of blood opened there, made brighter by her midnight skin. Then Sethy shouted, "No!" and knocked over chairs to get to her and wipe the jewels away. Other times, Beloved curled up on the floor. Her wrists between her knees, and stayed there for hours. Or she would go to the creek, stick her feet in the water, and wash it up her legs. Afterward, she would go to Sethy, run her fingers over the woman's teeth while tears slid from her wide black eyes. Then it seemed to Denver the thing was done. Beloved, bending over Sethy, 
looked the mother, Sethi the teething child, for other than those times when beloved needed her, Sethi confined herself to a corner chair. The bigger beloved got, the smaller Sethi became. The brighter beloved's eyes, the more those eyes that used never to look away, became slits of sleeplessness. Sethi no longer combed her hair or splashed her face with water. She sat in the chair, licking her lips like a chastised child, while beloved ate up her life, took it, swelled up with it, grew taller on it, and the older woman yielded it up without a murmur. Denver served them both, washing, cooking, forcing, cajoling her mother to eat a little now and then, providing sweet things for beloved as often as she could to calm her down. It was hard to know what she would do from minute to minute. When the heat got hot, she might walk around the house naked or wrapped in a sheet, her belly protruding like a winning watermelon. Denver thought she understood the connection between her mother and beloved. Sethi was trying to make up for the handsaw. Beloved was making her pay for it, but there would never be an end to that. And seeing her mother diminished, shamed, and infuriated her. Yet she knew Sethi's greatest fear was the same one Denver had in the beginning, that beloved might leave, that before Sethi could make her understand what it meant, what it took to drag the teeth of what saw under the little chin, to feel the baby blood pump up like oil in her hands, to hold her face so her head would stay on, to squeeze her so she could absorb. Still, the death spasms that shot through that adored body, plump and sweet with life, beloved might leave, leave before Sethi could make her realize that worse than that, far worse, was what baby Suggs died of, what Ella knew, what Stamp saw, and what made Paul D tremble, that anybody white could take your whole self for anything that came to mind. Not just to work, kill, or maim you, but dirty you, dirty you so bad you couldn't like yourself any more, dirty you so bad you forgot who you were and couldn't think it up. And though she and others lived through and got over it, she could never let it happen to her own. The best thing she was was her children. White's my dirty her, all right, but not her best thing, her beautiful magical best thing. The part of her that was clean, no undreamable dreams about whether the headless, feetless torso hanging in the tree with a sign on it was her husband or Paul A, whether the bubbling hot girls in the colored school fire set by patriots included her daughter, whether a gang of whites invaded her daughter's private parts, soiled her daughter's thighs, and threw her daughter out of the wagon. She might have to work the slaughterhouse yard, but not her daughter, and no one, nobody on this earth, would list her daughter's characteristics on the animal side of the paper. No, oh no, maybe baby Suggs could worry about it, live with the likelihood of it. Sethi had refused and refused still. This and much more, Denver heard her say from her corner chair. Trying to persuade beloved, the one and only person she felt she had to convince, that what she had done was right because it came from true love. Beloved, her fat new feet propped on the seat of a chair in front of the one she sat in, her unlined hands resting on her stomach, looked at her, uncomprehending everything except that Sethi was the woman who took her face away, leaving her crouching in the dark. Dark place, forgetting to smile. Her father's daughter, after all, Denver decided to do the necessary. Decided to stop relying on kindness to leave something on the stump. She would hire herself out somewhere. And although she was afraid to leave Sethi and Beloved alone all day, not knowing what calamity either one of them would create, she came to realize that her presence in that house had no influence on what either woman did. She kept them alive, and they ignored her, growled when they chose, soaked, explained, demanded, strutted, cowered, cried, and provoked each other to the edge of violence. Then over, 
she had begun to notice that even when Beloved was quiet, dreamy, minding her own business, Sethi got her going again, whispering, muttering some justification, some bit of clarifying information to Beloved to explain what it had been like and why and how come. It was as though Sethi didn't really want forgiveness given. She wanted it refused, and Beloved helped her out. Somebody had to be saved, but unless Denver got work, there would be no one to save, no one to come home to, and no Denver either. It was a new thought, having a self to look out for and preserve, and it might not have occurred to her if she hadn't met Nelson Lord leaving his grandmother's house as Denver entered it to pay a thank you for half a pie. All he did was smile and say, "Take care of yourself, Denver." But she heard it as though it were what language was made for. The last time she spoke to her, his words blocked up her ears. Now they opened her mind, weeding the garden, pulling vegetables, cooking, washing. She plotted what to do and how. The Bodwins were most likely to help since they had done it twice, once for baby sucks and once for her mother. Why not the third generation as well? She got lost so many times in the streets of Cincinnati. It was noon before she arrived, though she started out at sunrise. The house sat back from the sidewalk with large windows looking out on a noisy, busy street. The Negro woman who answered the front door said, "Yes, may I come in? What you want? I want to see Mister and Missus Bodwin." Miss Bodwin, they brother and sister. Oh, what you want them for? I'm looking for work. I was thinking they might know of some. You baby sucks kin, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Come on in. You letting in flies. She led Denver toward the kitchen, saying, "First thing you had to know is what door to knock on." But Denver only half heard her because she was stepping on something soft and blue. All around her was thick, soft, and blue, glass cases crammed full of glistening things, books on tables and shelves, pearl white lamps with shiny metal bottoms, and a smell like the cologne she poured in the Emerald House. Only better. Sit down, the woman said. You know my name? No, ma'am. Janie, Janie Wagon. How do you do? Fairly. I heard your mother took sick. That so? Yes, ma'am. Who's looking after her? I am, but I have to find work. Janie laughed. You know what? I've been here since I was fourteen, and I remember like yesterday when Baby Suggs, Holy, came here and sat right there where you are. White men brought her. That's how she got that house you all live in. Other things too. Yes, ma'am. What's the trouble with Sethi? Janie leaned against an indoor sink and folded her arms. It was a little thing to pay. But it seemed big to Denver. Nobody was going to help her unless she told it, told all of it. It was clear Janie wouldn't and wouldn't let her see the Baldwins otherwise. So Denver took the stranger what she hadn't told Lady Jones in return for which Janie admitted the Baldwins needed help, although they didn't know it. She was alone there, and now that her employers were getting older, she couldn't take care of them like she used to. More and more, she was required to sleep the night there. Maybe she could talk them into letting Denver do the night shift, come right after supper, say maybe get the breakfast. That way, Denver could care for Sethi in the day and earn a little something at night. How's that? Denver had explained the girl in her house who plagued her mother as a cousin come to visit, who got sick too and bothered them both. Janie seemed more interested in Sethi's condition. And from what Denver told her, it seemed the woman had lost her mind. That wasn't the Sethi she remembered. This Sethi had lost her wits finally, as Janie knew she would, trying to do it all alone with her nose in the air. Denver squirmed under the criticism of her mother, shifting in the chair and keeping her eyes on the inside sink. Janie Wagon went on about pride until she got to Baby Suggs. For whom she had nothing but sweet words. I never went to those woodland services she had, but she was always nice to me. Always, never be another like her. I miss her too," said Denver. 
Bet you do. Everybody miss her. That was a good woman. Denver didn't say anything else, and Janey looked at her face for a while. Neither one of your brothers ever come back to see how you all was. No, ma'am. Ever hear from them? No, ma'am. Nothing. Guess they had a rough time in that house. Tell me, this here woman in your house, the cousin, she got any lines in her hands? No, said Denver. Well, said Janey. I guess there's a god after all. The interview ended with Janey telling her to come back in a few days. She needed time to convince her employers what they needed. Night help because Janey's own family needed her. I don't want to quit these people, but they can have all my days and nights too. What did Denver have to do at night? Be here in case, in case what? Janie shrugged. In case the house burned down, she smiled then. Or bad weather slopped the road so bad I can't get here early enough for them. Case late guests need serving or cleaning up after. Anything. Don't ask me what white folks need at night. They used to be good white folks. Oh yeah, they good. Can't say they ain't good. I wouldn't trade them for another pair. Tell you that. With those assurances, Denver left, but not before she had seen sitting on a shelf by the back door a black boy's mouth full of money. His head was thrown back farther than a head could go. His hands were shoved in his pockets, bulging like moons. Two eyes were all the face he had above the gaping red mouth. His hair was a cluster of raised, widely spaced dots made of nail heads, and he was on his knees. His mouth, wide as a cup, held the coins needed to pay for a delivery or some other small service, but could just as well have held buttons, pins, or crab apple jelly. Painted across the pedestal, he knelt on were the words, "At your service." The news that Janie got hold of, she spread among the other colored women. Sethy's dead daughter, the one whose throat she cut, had come back to fix her. Sethy was worn down, speckled, dying, spinning, changing shapes, and generally bedeviled. That this daughter beat her, tied her to the bed, and pulled out all her hair. It took them days to get the story properly blown up and themselves agitated, and then to calm down and assess the situation. They fell into three groups: those that believed the worst, those that believed none of it, and those like Ella who thought it through. Ella, what's all this I'm hearing about Sethy? Tell me it's in there with her. That's all I know. The daughter, the killed one. That's what they tell me. How they know that's her? It's sitting there, sleep seats and raises hell, whipping Sethy every day. I'll be a baby, no grown. The age it would have been had it lived. You talking about flesh? I'm talking about flesh. Whipping her like she was batter. Guess she had it coming. Nobody got that coming. But Ella, but nothing. What's fair ain't necessarily right. You can't just up and kill your children. No, and the children can't just up and kill the mama. It was Ella more than anyone who convinced the others that rescue was in order. She was a practical woman who believed there was a route either to chew or avoid for every ailment, congestion, as she called it, clouded things and prevented action. Nobody loved her, and she wouldn't have liked it if they had, for they considered love a serious disability. Her puberty was spent in a house where she was shared by father and son, whom she called the lowest yet. It was the lowest yet who gave her a disgust for sex, and against whom she measured all atrocities, a killing, a kidnap, a rape, whatever. She listened and nodded. Nothing compared to the lowest yet. She understood Sethy's rage in the shed twenty years ago, but not her reaction to it. Which Ella thought was prideful, misdirected, and Sethy herself too complicated. When she got out of jail and made no gesture toward anybody and lived as though she were alone, Ella junked her and wouldn't give her the time of day. The daughter, however, appeared to have some sense after all. At least she had stepped out the door, asked for the help she needed, and wanted work. 
When Ella heard 124 was occupied by something or other beating up on Sethi, it infuriated her and gave her another opportunity to measure what could very well be the devil himself against the lowest yet. There was also something very personal in her fury. Whatever Sethi had done, Ella didn't like the idea of past errors taking possession of the present. Sethi's crime was staggering, and her pride outstripped even that. But she could not countenance the possibility of seeing, moving on in the house, unleashed and sassy. Daily life took as much as she had. The future was sunset. The past, something to leave behind. And if it didn't stay behind, well, you might have to stomp it out. Slave life, freed life. Every day was a test and a trial. Nothing could be counted on in a world where even when you were a solution, you were a problem. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, and nobody needed more. Nobody needed a grown-up evil sitting at the table with a grudge, as long as the ghost showed out from its ghostly place, shaking stuff, crying, smashing, and such. Ella respected it, but if it took flesh and came in her world. Well, the shoe was on the other foot. She didn't mind a little communication between the two worlds, but this was an invasion. Shall we pray? Asked the women. Uh huh, said Ella. First, then we got to get down to business. The day Denver was to spend her first night at the Baldwins, Mr. Baldwin had some business on the edge of the city and told Janey he would pick the new girl up before supper. Denver sat on the porch steps, with a bundle in her lap. Her carnival dress sun faded to a quieter rainbow. She was looking to the right, in the direction Mr. Baldwin would be coming from. She did not see the women approaching, accumulating slowly in groups of twos and threes from the left. Denver was looking to the right. She was a little anxious about whether she would prove satisfactory to the Baldwins, and uneasy too because she woke up crying from a dream about a running pair of shoes, the sadness of the dream she hadn't been able to shake, and the heat oppressed her as she went about the chores. Far too early, she wrapped a nightdress and hairbrush into a bundle. Nervous, she fidgeted the knot and looked to the right. Some brought what they could and what they believed would work, stuffed in apron pockets, strung around their necks, lying in the space between their be- breasts. Others brought Christian faith as shield and sword. Most brought a little of both. They had no idea what they would do once they got there. They just started out, walked down Bluestone Road, and came together at the agreed upon time. The heat kept a few women who promised to go at home. Others who believed the story didn't want any part of the confrontation and wouldn't have come, no matter what the weather. And there were those like Lady Jones who didn't believe the story and hated the ignorance of those who did. So thirty women made up that company and walked slowly, slowly toward one twenty-five. It was three in the afternoon on a Friday, so wet and hot, Cincinnati stench had traveled to the country. From the canal, from hanging meat and things rotting in jars, from small animals dead in the fields, town sewers and factories, the stench, the heat, the moisture, trust the devil to make his presence known. Otherwise, it looked almost like a regular workday. They could have been going to do the laundry at the orphanage or the insane asylum, corn shucking at the mill, or to clean fish, rings offal. Cradle white babies, sweep stores, scrape logskin, press lard, case pack sausage, or hide in tavern kitchens, so white people didn't have to see them handle their food. But not today. When they caught up with each other, all thirty, and arrived at one twenty-four, the first thing they saw was not Denver sitting on the steps, but themselves, younger, stronger, even as little girls lying in the grass asleep. Catfish was propping grease in the pan, and they saw themselves scoop German potato salad onto the plate. Cobbler oozing purple syrup colored their teeth. They sat on the porch, ran down to the creek, teased the men, hoisted children on their tips, or 
If they were the children, straddled the ankles of old men who held their little hands while giving them a horsey ride. Baby Suggs laughed and skipped among them, urging more. Mothers dead now moved their shoulders to mouth harps. The fence they had leaned on and climbed over was gone. The stump of the butternut had split like a fan, but there they were, young and happy, playing in Baby Suggs' yard. Not feeling the envy that surfaced the next day, Denver heard mumbling and looked to the left. She stood when she saw them. They grouped, murmuring and whispering, but did not step foot in the yard. Denver waved. A few waved back, but came no closer. Denver sat back down, wondering what was going on. A woman dropped to her knees. Half of the others did likewise. Denver saw lowered heads. But could not hear the lead prayer, only the earnest syllables of agreement that backed it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Hear me, hear me. Do it, Maker. Do it. Yes. Among those not on their knees, who stood holding one twenty-four in a fixed glare, was Ella, trying to see through the walls behind the door to what was really in there. Was it true the dead daughter come back, or pretend? Was it whipping, Sethy? Ella had been beaten every way but down. She remembered the bottom teeth she had lost to the break, and the scars from the belt were thick as rope around her waist. She had delivered, but would not nurse a hairy white thing, fathered by the lowest yet. It lived five days, never making a sound. The idea of that pup coming back to whip her too set her jaw working, and then. Ella hollered. Instantly, the kneelers and the standers joined her. They stopped praying and took a step back to the beginning. In the beginning, there were no words. In the beginning was the sound, and they all knew what that sound sounded like. Edward Baldwin drove a car down Bluestone Road. It displeased him a bit because he preferred his figure astride Princess, curved over his own hands. Holding the rings made him look the age he was, but he had promised his sister a detour to pick up a new girl. He didn't have to think about the way. He was headed for the house he was born in. Perhaps it was his destination that turned his thoughts to time. The way it dripped or ran, he had not seen the house for thirty years, not the butternut in front, the stream at the rear, nor the blockhouse in between, not even the meadow across the road. Very few of the interior details did he remember because he was three years old when his family moved into town, but he did remember that the cooking was done behind the house, the well was forbidden to play near, and that women died there. His mother, grandmother, an aunt, and an older sister before he was born. The man, his father and grandfather, moved with himself and his baby sister to Court Street sixty-seven years ago. The land, of course, eighty acres of it on both sides of Bluestone, was the central thing. But he felt something sweeter and deeper about the house, which is why he rented it for a little something if he could get it. But it didn't trouble him to get no rent at all, since the tenants at least kept it from the disrepair total abandonment would permit. There was a time when he buried things there, precious things he wanted to protect. As a child, every item he owned was available and accountable to his family. Privacy was an adult indulgence, but when he got to be one, he seemed not to need it. The horse trotted along, and Edward Baldwin cooled his beautiful mustache with his breath. It was generally agreed upon by the women in the society that, except for his hands, it was the most attractive feature he had: dark, velvety. Its beauty was enhanced by his strong, clean-shaven chin, but his hair was white, like his sister's, and had been since he was a young man. It made him the most visible and memorable person at every gathering, and cartoonists had fastened onto the theatricality of his white hair and big black mustache whenever they depicted local political antagonism. Twenty years ago. When the society was at its height in opposing slavery, it was as though his coloring was itself the heart of the matter. The bleached nigger was what his enemies called him. 
and on a trip to Arkansas, some Mississippi rivermen, enraged by the Negro boatmen they competed with, had caught him and shoe blackened his face and his hair. Those heady days were gone now. What remained was the sludge of ill will, dashed hopes, and difficulties beyond repair. A tranquil republic? Well, not in his lifetime. Even the weather was getting to be too much for him. He was either too hot or freezing, and this day was a blister. He pressed his hat down to keep the sun from his neck, where a heat stroke was a real possibility. Such thoughts of morality were not new to him. He was over seventy now, but they still had the power to annoy. As he drew closer to the old homestead, the place that continued to surface in his dreams, he was even more aware of the way time moved. Measured by the wars he had lived through, but not fought in, against the Miami, the Spaniards, the secessionists, it was slow. But measured by the burial of his private things, it was the blink of an eye. Where exactly was the box of tin soldiers, the watch chain with no watch, and who was he hiding them from? His father, probably a deeply religious man who knew what God knew and told everybody what it was. Edward Baldwin thought him an odd man in so many ways. Yet he had one clear directive: human life is holy, all of it, and that his son still believed, although he had less and less reason to. Nothing since was as stimulating as the old days of letters, petitions, meetings, debates, recruitment, quarrels, rescue, and downright sedition. Yet it had worked more or less, and when it had not, he and his sister made themselves available to circumvent obstacles, as they had when a runaway slave woman lived in his homestead with her mother-in-law and got herself into a world of trouble. The society managed to turn infanticide and the cry of savagery around, and build a further case for abolishing slavery. Good years they were, full of spit and conviction. Now he just wanted to know where his soldiers were and his watchless chain. That would be enough for this day of unbearable heat. Bring back the new girl and recall exactly where his treasure lay. Then home, supper, and God willing, the sun would drop once more to give him the blessing of a good night's sleep. The road curved like an elbow, and as he approached it, he heard the singers before he saw them. When the women assembled outside one twenty-four, Sethi was breaking a lump of ice into chunks. She dropped the ice pick into her apron pocket to scoop the pieces into a basin of water. Then the music entered the window. She was wringing a cool cloth to put on Beloved's forehead. Beloved, sweating profusely, was sprawled on the bed in the keeping room, a salt rock in her hand. Both women heard it at the same time and both lifted their heads. As the voices grew louder, Beloved sat up, licked the salt, and went into the bigger room. Sethi and she exchanged glances and started toward the window. They saw Denver sitting on the steps, and beyond her, where the yard met the road, they saw the rapt faces of thirty neighborhood women. Some had their eyes closed; others looked at the hot, cloudless sky. Sethi opened the door and reached for Beloved's hand. Together, they stood in the doorway. For Sethi, it was as though the clearing had come to her with all its heat and simmering leaves. Where the voices of women searched for the right combination, the key, the code, the sound that broke the back of words, building voice upon voice until they found it, and when they did it, was a wave of sound wide enough to sound the deep water and knock the pods off chestnut trees. It broke over Sethi, and she trembled, like the baptized in its wash. The singing women recognized Sethi at once and surprised themselves by their absence of fear when they saw what stood next to her. The devil child was clever, they thought, and beautiful. It had taken the shape of a pregnant woman, naked and smiling in the heat of the afternoon sun, thunder black and glistening. She stood on long straight legs, her belly big and tight, vines of hair twisted all over her head. Jesus. Her smile was dazzling. 
Sethi feels her eyes burn, and it may have been to keep them clear that she looks up. The sky is blue and clear, not one touch of death in the definite green of the leaves. It is when she lowers her eyes to look again at the loving faces before her that she sees him, guiding the mare, slowing down. His black hat, wide brimmed enough to hide his face, but not his purpose. He is coming into her yard, and he is coming for her best thing. She hears winds. Little hummingbirds stick needle beaks right through her headcloth into her hair and beat their wings. And if she thinks anything, this is no, 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 no. She flies. The ice pick is hot in her hand. It is her hand. Standing alone on the porch, beloved is smiling, but now her hand is empty. Sethi is running away from her, running, and she feels the emptiness in the hand Sethi has been holding. Now she is running into the faces of the people out there, joining them and leaving beloved behind, alone again. Then Denver running too, away from her to the pile of people out there. They make a hill, a hill of black people falling. And above them all, rising from his place with a whip in his hand, the man without skin, looking—he is looking at her.